because I think a focus on mortality is a useful thing to have, and that's why I begin my book with it. You, you should always know before you that, knew. that your time is very limited and that you're lucky to live in a time and place where you can be healthy till your 60s, as I was. Um, most people have, in history have never had a chance even to hope for a thing like that. Indeed. So, no, for the avoidance of hubris, I think it's good to have a sober feeling of the presence of death. Christopher Hitchens would have been 63 years old today. The British author and journalist died in December last year due to complications caused by cancer of the esophagus. Martin Amos once wrote, he thinks like a child, that is to say, his judgments are far more instinctive and moral, visceral than they seem and are animated by a child's eager apprehension of what feels just and true. He writes like a distinguished author and he speaks like a genius. It's not for everybody. Not everyone wants to uh, always be um, an awkward cuss or uh, out of step or against the stream. But if, if, that's, if, if you do feel that the consensus doesn't speak for you, if there's something about you that makes you feel that it would be worth being unpopular or marginal for the chance to lead your own life and have a life instead of a career or a job, then I can promise you it is worthwhile, yeah. Half the time when I was arguing with the so-called anti-war movement, they would say their reason for opposing the war was that if it, if, if it began, Saddam Hussein would obliterate huge numbers of Americans and Israelis and neighboring countries by his weapons of mass destruction. That's what, that was their case for peace, no, that he had the weapons. So now, well, the, the other I, in other, wor in other words, people, can be, people have to take part in their own deception. The, the only revolution internet which has a chance of... Um, be worth emulating, worth studying for other countries. It's pluralism, religious freedom, separation, sec secular separation, and the right of anyone to uh, try and make a living their own way and worship their own God. It's not may not sound very grandiose, but it's not bad, um, and will serve. And most of the countries I've been to in the past few years would all be taking a step up if they moved in that direction, and most of them know it. So to, to discover that. After it's all shaken out, that the American Revolution still has some life and purpose and meat and uh, muscle in it is, I think, a rather inspiring thing for someone of my age. I didn't think I'd have another chance to take part in a revolution. And now, yeah. in fact, the United States is involved in, in a combat that is yeah. Jeffersonian around, around the world. The worship of non-existent entities, the attempt to derive morality from, um, from the supernatural, all of that is um, more, I think, than mistaken or, or irritating, um, it's becoming actually very menacing now. The people who think they have permission of that sort from the heavens are trying to kill us. Hitch rose to prominence with books such as Letters to a Young Contrarian, God is Not Great, and his memoir, Hitch 22. But as much as anything, he was famed for his love of friendship. Here is something I admire deeply about you two, um, is the notion of friendship. You form bonds with Martin Amos, Julian Barnes, Ian McEwan and others. I've been very lucky with my contemporaries, I think. They taught me how to write. They, more, more they important, taught you how to write? Well, more important, perhaps, how not to write. I was a rather didactic, rather polemical writer when I first got to know them. I was, I was writing for the cause, rather. I, I wasn't paying very much attention to style. They pointed out to me, you know, it can be enjoyable to read and write things, as well as a, you know, a duty to do so. Um, introduced me to writers I hadn't appreciated enough, like Nabokov, for example, um, broadened my outlook, deepened my feeling for language, um, as well as providing me with a, with a wonderful context of, yes, amusing, amusing friendship. Michael Weiss once said friendship was his ideology. As Christopher liked to put it, friends are God's apology for relations. Joining me now, four friends, very good friends, who knew him better than anyone I know. They are Martin Amos, author of The Rachel Papers, Money, and The Pregnant Widow. James Fenton, former professor of poetry at Oxford. Ian McEwen, author of Atonement, Saturday, and Solar. And Salman Rushdie, author of Midnight's Children, The Satanic Verses, and The Enchantress of Florence. They have written more, but that was just a list of some of them we refer to now. I am pleased, especially pleased to have them here uh, to remember, reflect, appreciate, uh, talk about Christopher Hitchens, one of the favorite guests here on this program uh, over the last 20 years of our existence. And I began with Martin Amos. Um, give me a sense of, of who he was. Uh, oh, that's difficult. Uh, I, <clears throat> I, 
he was the only friend I've ever had. Um, I think this is a mark of friendship that isn't much explored. That you can say anything to, um, no matter how shameful, uh, how horribly revealing of yourself. You can admit to all your worst impulses. And you don't, I didn't, I never felt I had to tailor it to, to fit in with his idea of me. It was a, a, a candor that uh, established itself instantly and, um, and never wavered. Uh, but how to sum up the hitch? Well, he's a very unusual man. Uh, he, he flirted with ideology in a way I think that none, no one else at this table ever has. Mm. Um, he was, in fact, strongly ideological. Um, and it was until, not until the fall of communism in 1989 that he really blossomed as a writer, I think. Um, and even then, he was sort of looking out for other ideologies to, to um, hitch his wagon to for a bit. Uh, and th that's what gave us his uh, peculiar stance on Iraq. Um, he, he wasn't bien pensant, he wasn't very commonsensical. That's why uh, people loved him, because he, was, um, he, was, he seemed to be having the major argument with himself, uh, as if only the hitch was worth arguing with. Yes, James? Well, when I first knew him, um, he was absolutely the leading figure, one of the leading figures, on the revolutionary left in Oxford. And we, for our last year, we shared a house together. And uh, he was, a, I have to tell you, I don't think it's a secret, he was a very bad Trotskyite. He was <laughs> on the lazy side. I often used to <laughs> think... Was not getting up at eight to go to the back to barricades, was he? <laughs> well, I used to... <laughs> <laughs> I can remember putting the mug of coffee beside his bed, going back downstairs, then coming up, knocking on the door again, saying, Christopher, please get up, and then realizing that when he did get up, he, the coffee was going to be cold and he was going to do, go through that revulsion at the first mouthful of cold coffee, making the extra cup of coffee and so on. And the first thing, practically, that we did together, the first significant thing was we went to our revol the, the, his revolutionary group, which I wasn't yet a member of, and they used to meet in uh, rooms above pubs, you know, um, rooms that were normally um, used by an organization called the Elks, so that this is elk horns around. And we went to one of these rooms for the meeting and the plan was, as a friend and I, the, we were going to, we, we said, the reason why Christopher hasn't been coming to the meetings is that he's been working so hard proselytizing and here we are as uh, new members of the, we were prospective new members of the group. So we got him, we, we saved him from being <laughs> thrown out of the Trotskyist oh, movement. That was the first, that was the first thing we did. Yeah. <laughs> Last time Hitch, came to my house maybe two and a half years ago, two years ago in central London. Uh, it's a re an endless repetition, and, and we've all experienced this. The face, the great hairy unshaved face, came right into yours demanding that manly kiss. And on the last <laughs> occasion, Martin was already in the house, and I think your memory of this is not as distinct as mine. And he said, before I come in, before you pour me a drink, there's a woman on the other side of the square being harassed by some yobs, and we've got to go across and sort them out. And Martin and I looked at each other. Great. He said, there's only seven of them. Come on, there are three of us. <laughs> so we set off across the square. Two of us, very reluctant soldiers, private, this little private army, and we got there, thank God, there was no one there. They'd all gone. <laughs> <laughs> and I think of this story because he was a street fighter. I mean, intellectually, uh, and also he's chased villains down the street. He did it in Washington, some mugger he pursued. And I remember years ago in, in, in Manhattan, he pursued someone. He got uh, roughed Avenue up quite C. badly, yeah. um, rescuing a woman from yeah. uh, an abusive 
friend. Yeah. Oh, that could have been you and me. He got yeah. roughed up, yeah. rough up erasing graffiti. Absolutely, in, 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 in Beirut. In it was Beirut, in Beirut. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, he was, he was putting the graffiti up. Uh, yeah. He was writing some anti-fascist graffiti, yeah. and then the fascists jumped him. Jumped him. But I, mean, I you know, I remember I, mean, I first met Christopher a little. I mean, later than, than Martin and, and James knew him. I met him. I met him at the Notting Hill Carnival um, in somebody's house, and he was suspicious of me because I had friends on the left who were not the kind of left that Christopher approved of. You know, so he thought I was going to be. What sort of friends do you mean? <laughs> name names. I'm getting not name names. names. Tariq Ali. Um, <laughs> um, um, and, and he thought I would be, therefore, unsuitably leftist and was relieved to find that I was more suitable than he had feared. Um, but I, the street fighter thing is true, and I was very struck that when, when, you know, when God is Not Great came out and he had to go on, on tour for it, instead of doing the normal book tour, which all of us do, he asked for adversaries to be provided everywhere he went. You know, he asked the publishers to set him up with, with Christian opponents you know, in every city. Local tour. priests, I mean. Local uh, priests yeah. and et cetera, yeah. and of, of, an, of an absolutely opposite yeah. position, and he would take them on. And and that was his nature. He would want the debate. And he you know? knew his Bible. He knew his, yes. Yeah, and, I saw uh, one of those with Tony Blair. Yes, oh, that's yeah. right. He, yeah, well, that was late. He took on yeah. Blair. And, but demolishing Blair is not the hardest thing yeah. to do. Um, but he did it. Now, I thought that was very characteristic, that instead of just going to read from his book and do a signing, you know, he actually want everywhere he went, he wanted to take somebody on. He had hundreds of people in, in book lines saying to him, thank God you've come. We are not just the Bible Belt. Yeah, there were plenty of secular... But each of you is defined by writing. Is he more defined by debate than writing? Well, I, I slightly disagree with what Martin said about 1989 being when he, when he sort of became a writer, um, because I, th I don't think it was something unpremeditated, unthought of in his, in his scheme of things. I think 1989 was something he, he would have welcomed at any time, uh, i.e. The, f the fall of uh, Eastern Europe, of communism. Um, but he would have welcomed it from a um, socialist point of view. And <clears throat> I think that, but I, I, I do think that before he went to the States, he wasn't really, he wasn't really at his best as a writer as such. He uh, he was extremely political, extremely good in conversation. Extreme. He'd always been very, very good in debate. He was a marvelous public speaker, um, but he was a bit on the sloppy side with the with, with the writing. But then in the states, he became more and more more and more of a writer, and um, I I think this was uh, it, it, it was. You know, perhaps a slower development for him than it had been for other people around this table. Uh, George Orwell was his what, Martin? Uh, um, he was what Saul Bellow is for you. Maybe he, he, Hitch always used to stress that he said it's very important that um, to recognize that Orwell wasn't a genius, that his his um, strength was a kind of exalted common sense. Um, <clears throat> but it, it's amazing how, how often Orwell turns out not only to be right, but to have said the, the best thing about uh, you know, any number of subjects. Christopher was a very good hater. I mean, he started off really hating a sequence of people who were worth hating. You know, he hated Henry Kissinger. Um, he hated Mother Teresa. And later on, he hated Bill Clinton. Yeah. And I think those, those, those were vehement, but they weren't just emotional. They were highly articulated, thought-out hatreds. And I think he was, he was very good at that. And, and of course, it would always remind you that I also have written about people like Thomas Jefferson that, mm -hmm. <laughs> that I didn't hate. Yeah, that's true. I yeah. mean, he was really a member of the anti-totalitarian left. I mean, and yeah. uh, all of us, I mean, certainly we three can remember during the Falklands, war. Yeah. Most of the country was for it, but most of the people one knew were against, except for Hitch. 
uh, because his argument was, and it turned out to be uh, absolutely right, that to wage war uh, against the Argentinians would be to lead to the fall of the Junta and the fall of Galtieri. Uh, and that was a consistent theme. That ran all the way through. His Iraq stand was really uh, well, in line with that. Can you say that what you just expressed is a direct line to why he took the position he did about Iraq? Yes, well, I, I, I think it, I think it sort of is, but um, on the way, the, there's a, there's what 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 Christopher had to do bef just round about that time was he had to he had to he had to change his mind publicly, and in a way that for many people would be humiliating because he was re completely realigning himself politically. Mm. And so a certain amount of what that was was he, um, at, uh, at high decibel level saying to the rest of the world, you, you have changed, you've all changed, uh, the left has changed, and so on, and so uh, making it seem less obvious that, that, that his position had changed. His position had changed, but, it was, but this this thing about him was consistent that interventionism was a good idea. Now, in, in, um, in the case of Iraq, what he, what he said was, um, I, remember him, I remember him saying it to me over the phone. He, say, he said, uh, what Iraq will become is a protectorate. It's an American protectorate. And that will be the basis in the future. And as a result of that, we won't need uh, yeah. Saudi Arabia. Um, Iraq will be will be the basis from which we then export democracy, mm. de yeah, was, democratic institutions. And it was a mistake. Was, and, uh, and, and, I mean, I think one of the oh. things too you were saying about friendship and what Martin was saying also is that one of the things you could do with with Christopher is to radically disagree with him without harming the friendship. Mm. You know, that, that's a, you could yeah, you, yeah, could, you could you could take him on, <laughs> you know, or or be taken on by him yeah. about whatever idea you had. And, and express yourself as vehemently as possible, and it wouldn't really shake the basis of, of your fondness for each other at all. That's <laughs> Tell me about the story about uh, John Le Carre, <laughs> which he, oh, John. You, you were having a public spat with yes. him, oh, and well, Christopher waded in, waded in and waded, made it ten waded times worse. <laughs> no, I mean, well, <laughs> what had happened was that Le Carre, at, at the time of the um, Iranian attack on the Satanic Verses, was one of the few... I mean, so few, the writers who were not supportive, that you could count them on the fingers of both hands and have some fingers mm -hmm. to spare. But he was one of those. Right. And he accused me of various um, self-regarding acts, like, you know, I'd done it on purpose to make myself more famous and make more money and be, you know, etc. cetera. Um, and, how, and he said something about how one couldn't insult a religion with impunity. You know, mm -hmm. thus, thus suggesting that if you did, it was okay for you to be attacked. You know? <laughs> um, Anyway, I let that go at the time because I had some larger fish to fry. And then some years later, he, Le Carre, got into trouble here in New York because he said something uh, which the American Jewish community disapproved of. And so he was accused in some way of having made an anti-Semitic remark. You know, and he got very, very upset and wrote um, a, a, a large rebuttal you know, of his, how dare, how dare they call me anti-Semitic. And so I just, I don't know, I shouldn't have done it, but I sort of leapt in and I said, well, it would be more easier to sympathize with this writer under attack from this religious group if that particular writer had been more sympathetic to another writer being attacked by a different <laughs> religious group. And, and this, this drove Le Carre around the bend and he started abusing me and then I sort of abused him back. And, and this was very enjoyable for the English press who were running this, this exchange of letters on the front page. And then Christopher jumped in and wrote the rudest letter I think <laughs> you remember this <laughs> anybody's ever written to <laughs> what did he say it was about he, he said something about he said how that Le Carre reminded him of a man who urinates in his own in his hat and then puts the brimming <laughs> chapeau on his head um, and then went on <laughs> that was just the first sentence is anybody at this table surprised <laughs> no no, not. no 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 he liked being rude to people yeah. But he also liked to be liked. So the, the, that's yeah. a, the, 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 there was um, always a paradox as, as, as a socialist and a man of the people, how rude he could be to cabbies. I mean, 
The oh, only, really? Yeah. Oh, my God, it's so <laughs> embarrassing sometimes. No, you'd say to uh, waiters, if you're so smart, what are you yeah. doing, doing dealing them off the arm in a yeah. dump like this? Or you'd yeah, say to a taxi driver, <laughs> if you're so smart, why are you steering this bedpan around? Town? I mean, you completely you made us all get out of the cab. <laughs> and you wanted to get out. And sneak wanted, out. When he, was, when he was ill, we got into a cab to go, and, and Hitch said, uh, we're going to the Natural History Museum, and the guy was Ukrainian. and said, well, I don't know where it is. He said, well, we're getting out. You don't know... You're living in this country, you don't know where the natural history museum, you don't deserve our fare. And Hitch got out, and he almost fell over on the pavement, he was so ill. Yeah. And Carol and I got out too, we had to get another cab with a, an approved cabbie who, who knew where the natural history museum was. Wasn't there a time also that you got into a little thing, you wrote him a lovely letter saying, talking about the difference between uh, being an atheist and being an agnostic? Yeah. Um, well, I... I think um, agnosticism is the more rational position because since we know so very little about the universe, it's, it's um, uh, a bit previous to say that there's no higher intelligence. Since the universe is much cleverer than we are, and we, we have, you know, uh, cosmology is almost going backwards. We're just finding out more about our ignorance. Um, and Hitch. And I said in the piece that um, strict atheism c is vulnerable to the accusation, and Hitch would never be vulnerable to this accusation, of being Lenten, of being a bit pinched and crabbed. Um, and we, we did disagree about that. But as Salman says, um, we had violent arguments about Trotsky and Lenin, etc. But... Um, there were, I never had a slightest wobble in my friendship with Hitch. It was. Uh, and then I think the God point. thing. I, mean, I think you know, in different ways, one could have a dis different position to Christopher on that. I mean, I, I used to feel that religion as a private matter was not my business. You know, that that if there were people who found sustenance or moral strength or whatever it might be from from religious observance then it wasn't for me to tell them not to you know and 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 christopher's view was more absolutist than that and was you know as his the subtitle of his book had it that religion poisons everything you know and yeah. that uh, and that you can't make that private public distinction as he argues in the book because the trouble with those private beliefs is that people use them to justify attacks on on actual individuals you know in the public sphere so you could have that disagreement with with Christopher without without it affecting your thinking. But I do. I actually think the the religion moment, the God is not great moment, is sort of the moment at which Christopher came back from his uh, from if you like from the Iraq mistake, you know, and kind of regained his genuine intellectual ground. I mean, the things that he was that we all I guess I accepted or thought of more as the real Christopher. And, and I think that's when he got his audience back here people began to actually become very fond of him. Uh, during the Iraq years, I think there were a lot of people who were very disappointed or angry with his, with his positions. And then, and then he sort of regained this and ended up very beloved. What about this idea that goes all the way back to Oxford, this notion that, he, that it was a double life, there was a double set of books? Yes. What is that? Well, do you mean that he, had, he always had friends on the left and friends on That's the right? That's right, yeah. Sort of yeah. conservative social friends on one side and, and his um, ideological friends somewhere yes. else. Well, this is, a, this is absolutely the case. And people on the, le people on the left saw it, and they, they, they saw it as a kind of treachery. They knew that he was doing things like... He's partying with one and preaching with the other. That's right. Yes. But that, 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 yes. That, and they accused him of being a Bollinger Bolshevik and all that. But that's uh, why should the rich people drink all the champagne? I mean, it wasn't. It was. <laughs> yes. it, it was. There was. Uh, there, there was a particular um, character in Oxford at the time who who, who was a, a much uh, disliked figure on 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 the, by the students because he seemed to represent everything everything that was wrong with. Oxford. He was the warden of all souls. His name was John Sparrow. And Christopher, seeing John Sparrow, Christopher would just, he was going to charm John Sparrow. And he, and he, and he jolly did. He was, he, 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 he was, he was, he was, 
he was the biggest flirt mm. in the history of flirting. I mean, he, <laughs> he really was. He could flirt. He could flirt. <laughs> and flirting with men was absolutely, uh, um, you know, as much as flirting, flirting with women. At that, that time when uh, he had to leave a party early, and about 20 people there of both sexes, and he said, I'll, I'll just make a brief pass at everyone here, and then I'll be on my way. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that double life, though, extended to the books, too. I mean, you think of his taste in poetry, uh, passionate about Chesterton, right. and Belloc, Kipling, as well as... You know, yes. Non-revolutionary poets. Yes. Mm. yes. In fact, that last piece he was trying to write as he, as he was dying was on... On a biography of Chesterton. Chesterton. Well, he did yeah. write it. Yeah. Um, no, and it's sort of know your enemy, isn't it? Get get close to your enemy. This is yeah. If you're getting that close, it's not an enemy. <laughs> it's, 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 it's it's having chums on both. It's having chums on both sides. Yeah. Yeah. He liked, he liked and, um, he he's liked very, his he's very proud of a picture he has of himself on a grouse moor. Do you remember he came to a Friday lunch one, yeah. showed us this mm. picture, he's in all fours and yeah. there's a gun and various sort of and flunkies it, standing around. And it was always one of the characteristics of these parties that he would have in D.C. For example, he always had one around the time of the White House Correspondents' exactly. Dinner. And, right. and you'd always and, go over and, there after the... Yeah, White and if House you looked at who was in the room, I mean, it was the entire spectrum. Of, of political opinion yeah, yeah. and you know in, in, in the United States it wasn't just one gang you know it was really was everyone and he wanted that he didn't write fiction no uh, he, he was we often wondered why we, we, yeah why yeah, in fact, we I'm asking. sometimes uh, uh, well it wasn't he wasn't a literary well, type no he was <laughs> Yeah, well, he, he wasn't, wasn't a literary type. He, he, he wouldn't like to hear that. Well, he, I, he, I don't he, think he, he would. knew lots of poetry and so on. It wasn't that yeah. he wasn't literary, but he, he wasn't. Was, he read, but, he didn't, he read but didn't write, is that what I we say? I don't think he would be interested in spending his day with imaginary people. Uh, I think, you know, I think real, that's a good well said. I mean, I think uh, the reason he stayed in D.C. and you know, never came to live in a city like, like this one, like New York, is that he liked to be in that in the bubble, you know, inside that world of what was what was going on and who that was, was real. The people him. who were making politicians made decisions that yeah. were real. And then, and then he would go places yeah. to find out right. what was going on. Then how do you characterize yeah. his influence on the political debates? Well, I just think he became impossible to ignore. Yeah. You know that it, 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 he could whether I mean, you agreed with him or not, you had to hear yeah, him. Yeah, because he was so super articulate and and very very knowledgeable about it. he never took on stuff without knowing his without knowing his subject you know so so you could agree with him or disagree with him dramatically but he became one of the voices that you had to deal with and i think he wanted to be that person what happened to your friendship uh, when you wrote why i am why i embraced islam well i mean you know he was a but I mean, christopher was an ally of course as i say you know whether he agreed with you or not you know i mean and that was a i mean it was a weak moment for me and i think he understood the reason for the weakness um, but I think, you know, to go back up a little bit from that, I think the other thing that happened to Christopher in 1989, you know, other than the fall of communism, um, was the attack on, on my novel and, uh, and his beginning to be aware of the threat, as he saw it, of, of radical Islam. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think, you know, from there to the 9-11 attack, you know, there was a, a, in him a, a growing sense that there was... A real problem here that people weren't looking at straight, you know, and mm -hmm. and uh, and that became a growing part of his of his interest, and so mm -hmm. it brought us closer together. But you close together, yeah, yeah, no yeah, yeah. I'm also very proud. I have a chapter on this too, having been a friend of Salman Rushdie's during the time of the fatwa when he was on the run, when not only did a friend need his friends, but when a very important principle, the, the whole principle of free expression, needed to be defended against the most direct, uh, thuggish possible challenge, I mean, a, a death threat backed by death squads from the theocratic leader of a foreign state. And when a lot of people didn't show too much stomach for that, that no, battle, no, that were. was a very educational time in my life. Are we missing out just how funny he was? Yeah, I mean, well, I want to make sure. I mean, the first time I met it was Martin who introduced me to Hitch. He said, you've got to meet my friend. So what did he say when Martin said... If, you, I, if you, only I can remember exactly what was happening. <laughs> First we went to Martin's rather disgusting little flat. Uh, I'm sure the word sock was born. Uh, and then we went... Uh, it seemed to specialise in those days in empty Greek restaurants. Uh, the only customers. <laughs> and the, 
the, the two of you had a routine already worked out. Um, <laughs> jokes were referred to merely by numbers or sounds or yelps that referred to long stories that had already been sort of um, encapsulated. The next morning I woke up, I felt as if my ribs had been kicked. Yes, um, because you'd laughed so much. No, and I mean, then I, he, was, he was very, very... No funny. question. I mean, I can remember sitting in Martin's kitchen in, in London actually weeping with, with laughter. I mean, actually, there's not very many people have actually caused tears of laughter yeah. to run down my face, but Christopher would do that. He, he once said about you, though, he said that the thing, <laughs> <laughs> lots of things he said about you, uh, but one was that he said that, that about friendship, he said that uh, your love of language took precedence over your love of friendship. Um, I've been thinking about this. Um, when, when he came to, from America to England on visits, he used to ring from the airport and say, the hitch has landed. Is that what he, how, yeah. what he called himself, the hitch? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, um, well, Self-conscious <laughs> irony. <laughs> and I, I would feel great excitement, but also the sense that I'm going to lose a chapter here. The chapter's worth of work. <laughs> and you'd have these amazing long lunches followed by a debauch in the evening that would leave you completely incapacitated for three, three days, days and three days, nights. Days, days. And, but he would go off, at, <laughs> just as you were sort of falling on your bedroom floor, he would go off and write a piece. Um, and, I, and his generosity with time was amazing, that he would give time. Mm. Uh, he was a person for whom the clock hands moved slower. His day was longer than ours. Um, and his, uh, his energy on your behalf, which I, I've experienced too, mm. was extraordinary. And he'd get on a plane and, yeah. and come and deal with it, you know. Yeah. And, and uh, I just, if you're a novelist you're, or a poet, then you're going to spend a lot of time brooding. Um, and I, I think that's why Hitch could not have been a novelist, no. although he had the, the gift of phrase and of mimicry and all the rest. But he wasn't a brooder, I don't think. No, he, none of that determined stupor. He, he no. Was, I mean, he no. was, he a did have... A determined stupor. It's what V.S. V. Pritchett um, denounced Ford Maddox Ford for not having. Um, <laughs> the, the great novelists have the capacity for determined <laughs> stupor. stupor. But, I always but, thought... And Christopher was, in that sense, he was a journalist. He had that, he had that sort of yeah. file your copy approach, you know, yeah. and, and yeah. he would, he would, as Martin says, he'd go home after a long day of drinking and... And lots of and, 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 yeah. you know, and, and he'd write like 3,000 words and or file them. Or you'd fall asleep you know, in and, his apartment. And, and they would not be incoherent, they'd be extraordinary words. Yeah. I mean, that was... One of his uh, later utterances uh, in writing was that he did burn the candle at both ends, and he said, and sometimes that gives off a lovely light. Mm. But, yeah. by Christ, he did that. Um, in, in a sort of... Uh, preternatural way, I mm. always saw it. And, and I think knew that, that it contributed to the illness that came upon him. If you had known that there was a possibility of getting cancer, you would never have spoke, you have never smoked a cigarette, you would have never drank the, or consumed the amount of liquor you consumed. No, I think all the time I've, I've felt that it's, life is a wager, and that I probably uh, was getting more out of leading a bohemian existence as a writer than I would have if I didn't. So, and writing is what's important to me and anything that helps me do that or enhances and prolongs and deepens um, and sometimes intensifies argument and conversation is worth it to me, sure. So I was, I was knowingly taking a risk. I wouldn't recommend it to others. But he believed that the cigarettes and the booze gave him what he called a kind of junk energy. A ju oh, junk energy. Right. And that, and so in a sense, um, he was under the impression that he needed, that he needed that, those, those two um, substances as, as a boost. Might not have written as, as much if he as, hadn't as, had that as, junk energy? As well, boosters. Part of the tragedy was that he was so robust. If he'd just been a little weaker physically, he would have taken all that drinking and smoking, all that rump and whatever yeah. the word is in Hindi that means... Or, or drinking and smoking at the same time. Um, yeah. For all the drinking, he had one of the best memories of anyone no, I mean, he had, he, had, he did have this Incredible ridiculous memory. head for drink, and I don't think it did him that much good. No, <laughs> he, he, the, the, the yeah. body didn't give yeah. him enough warning mm. signs. I think he said yeah. about you, James, that somehow after that you awakened in him 
uh, the far buried and dangerous lust for alcohol and nicotine. Oh, it's your fault. Ah. <laughs> yeah, I know he's often accused me of, <laughs> of that, simply yeah. because I bought him a drink in the King's Arms in 1957. Yep. I mean, this really seems a bit in excess of the, <laughs> of the facts. Uh, I, I want to talk about two things. I want, I want to come back to uh, this nature of friendship. I mean, you, you and I have spoken about this before at this table. The notion of, I mean, I think there was a quote in which he said something about, uh, he called the relationship he had with you the most heterosexual relationship that one young man could conceivably have with another. And you said at the same time, it was an unconsummated gay marriage. <laughs> Martin, I didn't, you, know. I didn't know it was unconsummated. <laughs> or that there was a marriage. <laughs> so that's no, a no, civil partnership, country, Martin. Yeah, Martin. Yeah. No, 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 put no, your no, cards no. on the table. Yeah. He tried to you consummate it every now and then. Yeah, he, he tried to consummate it every well, now and then. Well, he was sort of pan affectionate. Um, yeah. He. Big kisses. Big, um, yeah. Tongues. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I know it was in the, well, in uh, the too much uh, information. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> um, this is a family show. <laughs> and uh, it's an idea show. You know, you say that he 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 sort of uh, lays it in on Wolfowitz, um, and he would perhaps do that for an hour or two. But uh, he was the most egalitarian of uh, socialites. You're changing the subject, aren't um, you? Well, I'm, I, I have no case to answer. Um, and he, 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 was, he was very rude, as we said, and a talented hater and all the rest. Mm. But he, socially, his manners were impeccable and, um, and completely democratic, too. Um, yeah, but let me, let me can I, may I just stay with this for a couple of moments? Sure. One, yeah. one, one was that he cast himself as this smaller fish swimming alongside a great white shark. <laughs> he did say that about you. Now that had to do with, you know, the ladies. The ladies, of course. Oh, it did. right. Yeah. 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 He said he was a small parties, fish casting alongside a great white shark. Speaking of you, <laughs> um, well, he he was um, incredibly unpredatory as a unpredatory. Yeah. Right. Um, girls would often throw themselves at him, and uh, for a good reason. He, well, yeah. yeah attractive. I mean, very attractive. You know. And, and um, brilliant. As you know, w what he his what he would do to charm people was to turn his intelligence on, on them and show his intelligence and that was his that was his uh his way of of, of attracting people but he 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 was very diffident yeah, yeah but at the same time was he nicholas in your novel uh yes he so, was yeah and so there was nicholas and you were keith and yeah you know. yeah up to a point yeah um <laughs> in, in as much as you know you I, once they're in a novel, the character changes to fit the novel. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it never is uh, uh, the, yeah. the person himself. But uh, there was one story that's, that's in the novel and I thought was so great that I had to make a scene to give the punchline that Hitch gave, which was we were in a, one of these empty Greek restaurants and two very upper-class young men came in and they were fussing around with the waiters and they had a terrible air about them as if they were you know stoically awaiting the deaths of elderly relatives so that they could come into their patrimony and um, they were fussing around so much so that it was impossible for for Hitch and me to, to start a conversation and then one of them came and crouched down in front of us and pouted up through his fr fringe and said they were obviously going to ask us to move tables, but he, he said, he said, you're going to hate, us, hate me for this. And Hitch said, I hate you already. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, go ahead. <laughs> uh, and um, we moved tables quite genially, and they sent, sent over a terrified bottle of wine. And, mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but, but if you just sort of introduce him to your mother and your crazy aunts and so on, he would be absolutely impeccable and yeah. gentle socially. Um, let, me, let me raise this question about America. What did America mean to him? Because uh, he obviously came here and became an American citizen. I think, I think he, found his, he found his full voice, I think, here. Mm. I think, you know, he, because, I mean, as, as we heard in one of the... Uh, clips you showed. I think he was actually very admiring 
of aspects of America, of its, of its constitution. And, 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 and he uh, became a naturalized citizen at the Jefferson Memorial. Yeah, yeah. and mm. he became an even more of an American post 9-11. I mean, 9-11 was yeah. a, a, a turning point, a, a revamping of his love for the United States. If you went to see him in his apartment, he'd love to take you know, strangers up onto the roof and point out the monuments as if he'd built them himself. You know? yeah. <laughs> I mean, he was very proprietorial. It was his Washington, yeah. too. Mm -hmm. And as he was saying on that clip, he, he, he was very moved by the American Revolution. He thought yeah. this was a revolution that had worked. Yeah. And I think he loved the fact that it's an immigrant society and uh, mm -hmm. yeah. the diversity that followed. From In this book, um, Hitch 22, he writes about uh, you know, the first three chapters, and he, and he talks about, actually, in the edition, one edition, this photograph in which uh, I think it was described, and I, I, I should give credit to the photographer. And Angela Gorgas. You know. Yes. You know. Um, he was described as the late Christopher Hitchens, which gave him a provider for him or was an impetus for him or forced him or linked him to consider mortality. And, and, and he sort of talks about this in the first three chapters here. Um, so let's talk finally about sort of the end and, and, and how he handled death. And, and each of you visited him and, and uh, saw him and talked to him. So did I in terms of an interview. When I went to do the interview, he was obviously not feeling well. Hmm. You know, and I said, Hitch, we don't have to do this now. We can, I'll come back another time. You know, he said, no, I want to do it now. He had a bucket next to him. You know, and, and he's talked about that too. I mean, it, it, and the evolution of the conversation, it seems to me, and correct me because you were a thousand times closer than I was, was from, in terms of the illness, was sort of metaphysical, and then it became, in his writings, describing the physicality of it, hmm. you know, and then perhaps somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, How did well, he just, approach dying? Well, just to say at the very beginning of it, I mean, when Hitch 22 came out, uh, its publication event was here at the 92nd Street Y, and I had agreed to go and, and lob questions at him, right. you know, and, and um, so I did, and he was at his best, you know, he was at his kind of... Knocking him out of the park. His Hitchens' best, exactly. I mean, I, and, and, I mean, I wasn't just throwing softballs, you know, there were a few curveballs in there, but he was brilliant, brilliant, for, and for at least an hour and then a bit more with the Q&A, and then afterwards there was a dinner for him and with a few friends and, and publishing people and so on, and, and he continued, you know, to just hold forth and be at his absolute peak, and then... Afterwards, I discovered, as we all did, that that, that, that was the day. That he morning had, he that had, morning he had that been he had. told about the cancer. And I just thought, how do you do that? I mean, I wouldn't be able to do that, I don't think, you know, to go out there in front of a thousand people and just perform brilliantly when you've just been given, you know, possibly terminal news. A death sentence. Mm, a death sentence. One way he dealt with death was to write so well about it. I mean, you remember those early pieces for uh, Vanity Fair, Vanity Fair or, I think. For, in his column? Yeah. Uh, described really in terms of crossing a border, uh, the border guards being the medics who greet you as you come across and suddenly you're in different clothes and the land of the healthy that you leave behind uh, was beautifully done at the very beginning. Um, visiting him was, well, I mean, we all went. Uh, it was not like visiting most others because he didn't want to talk about being ill. He wanted to talk about reading and what was going on and, and everything else. And then he w needed to sleep a lot, and he'd like to find you there when he woke up. That w so the deal was, if he went to visit the Hitch, you'd take some books and some work, sit at the foot of the bed and wait a couple of hours till he come round, stir, empty his lungs uh, disgustingly, and then resume. Mm. Uh, Incredible appetite. He really did not want to die. He really, I mean, for all sorts of reasons, but he really did hang on. I think that going on writing till almost the very end was yeah. actually one of the ways of resistance. I think it was one of the things that kept him going. I took a picture of him writing that last piece on chest and it was sort of drips. And I mean, if you think about it, it was painful to swallow, very difficult to breathe. Uh, his limbs ached, his arm hurt like crazy, and he was facing eternal oblivion. And he needed to get these 3,000 words done. He was, um, he was determined to make, a, to make a good end. That's right. And he a had, a decision he had, that was he made. Had, he had made 
a, a, a point of um, identifying himself as standing for a certain kind of uh, rationality, and that rationality in the in the uh, face of death was you know, the logical conclusion of of um, what he'd said he would what he'd set himself up as. Um, and so it, it was. Ex I, th I think. It, I think everybody learned uh, about Hitch that he, how, how extraordinarily large his audience was at that point, and how extraordinary it was that the, there was this audience that was concerned about uh, that. A part of the audience was saying, "You know, will he repent?" And yes, of course. Yeah, that yeah. Did, did, <laughs> delight, did, delightful for Christopher. Yes. Oh no, he wouldn't. Uh, he because, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't he? I would say, "Oh no, he wouldn't." <laughs> no, 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 he wouldn't. There, were, there were people <laughs> praying for him, which was yeah. you know, oh, that's right. The, they were the wrong, yeah. the wrong yeah. thing to do. Yeah. We all took that's part right. in a link-up oh, TV I, I think program. I, I, think I actually were, talked to him about that. You know, yeah. people praying for you. Yes, we talked. We talked. Do you remember we were all in that linked up program? Mm. Uh, you were sitting by I, the I bedside. Was, you were here, and then there yeah. were there was some event in, um, in London. In London, yeah. but it was being piped to cinemas, movie houses all across uh, all pa all sold out Packed. from the hospital room. Yeah, no, it was no, from a stage. It was we, what's his Stephen name? Fry. Stephen Fry. Talked to various was, friends. There were people on stage. Oh, Stephen Fry. We were all doing right. it on linked but, up London. But Christopher was oh, sitting right, right, in, right, in, right. The, in the, in the hospital room. This. Yeah. But uh, what was so extraordinary was that people, there were, there were camera moved across the audience. The audience was mostly young. They mostly would have disagreed with him violently on Iraq, but they were turning up in these cinemas to, to hear him or to Did hear he talk, talk about, about his own legacy and what he, it, it, at all, the sense of uh, a life lived, a sense of, you he know, somebody, about, people talk about reading your own obituary. He must have read quite a few rather premature obituaries. I mean, there was one at the New York Times, a good 18 months, a year were, before. There, yes, there were a lot of people they came felt, felt that they had to write that, that kind yeah. of piece. I, I, I think James is right, that, he, that he, d he was determined to die well, and it's very hard to do, and how is it done? And who was it who said that it's, it is very difficult for a, a sick man not to be a villain? Mm -hmm. And he was determined to, to buck that law. Um, not to be a villain or not to be weak? Not, not to be, not, <laughs> I mean, I, I saw him so sick sometimes that I thought I would just be whimpering with self-pity. And he was determined not to do that. Not to go there. Uh, or not and, to go to regret or not to go to uh, change. I am I who I am and I am still who I am. That and, and just that there, there is no tougher challenge than to, to cope with death as Freud called it, the complex symbol. It's something that, you know, the reason we have religion is because of death and how, how very difficult it is to, to f come face to face with it. And um, religion says, you, you needn't do that. Um, we'll postpone all that. And it, it, so it was a, he was living up to his yeah, secularist one, one courage. One of the things he most disliked about religion was the idea that if we are told that we have a life after death, it makes us not value or pay attention to the life we have. Yeah. You know, I mean, if, if, as it were, our real life yeah. uh, happens with our, you know, in, with, in our heavenly self when we are immortal, then this life doesn't matter. So it gives you, so it diminishes the value of actual lived human life. And I think Christopher very much wanted to show that the value is here. You know, it's here, not afterwards. It's here. When was the last time you saw him? I saw him exactly one year ago today. Um, mm -hmm. I was uh, I was in Houston, Texas, for his birthday. Right. I guess I saw him two or three weeks before he died. We were actually having a conversation about Larkin and and yeah. um, a couple of lines in Whitson Weddings, and I knew I was about to leave to go to the airport. And we came to the end of that discussion, and, and I went to kiss him, and he said, "He said, just go, go." Uh, he didn't want mm. an emotional parting. He thought, Let, let's keep it in, that we will see each other soon, which was as devastating as anything. It's just sort of go, just go. Uh, I, you, I you saw, him, I saw him die. Yeah. Um, and it was, uh, I arrived, and it was sort of already all over, and he was unconscious. And, you know, you go and hug him and talk to him. But I, I, 
I like to think he might have sensed my presence. And then it became a, with the family, his children and wife and father-in-law and cousin, and we just sat there, and um, five, six hours. And what, you do, what happens is you, you look at him and how labored his breathing is. Then you look at the screen, the monitor screen, and you see the br blood pressure changes every hour because you, you can hear that clasp coming on, and dropping, and the, and the oxygenation and the breath, the rate of breathing, until it just sank into nothing. And it was. Mm. Uh, I think we were all sitting by the phone. You know, and there was a moment in the middle of the night when the phone rang, and I didn't wasn't necessary to pick up the phone, mm. you know, I, I, it was very sad. James, write the first line of the obituary for us. Well, um, to me, he was the, uh, he was the spirit of 68. Um, it was the revolutionary spirit that was so, um, um, engaging and uh, the source, I suppose, of many ridiculous things that were said and felt, but many fine things too. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, James. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. Christopher Hitchin uh, died age 62. Uh, he would have been 63 today. Um, someone that loved him or hate him, uh, you could not ignore him. Uh, because he said things with such brilliance and insight and uh, gift of language, uh, never more powerful than when he was on stage, uh, when there was an audience and a connection, uh, a great program uh, here time after time, uh, as we talked about many subjects. Thank you for joining us this evening, an appreciation of Christopher Hitchens. See you next time. Anger I can't muster. Um really, because it's necessary that people die. It would be terrible if people did not. People have to die in large numbers every day so as to make room. Um, I'm leaving the party a bit earlier than I'd like. Much earlier than I'd like. Or, or rather, I, I'm, it looks as if I might have to yeah, leave exactly. it quite a little bit earlier than I'd like. And not only that, but the party will go on without me. Even more horrible thought. But why should I be enraged at that? That would be spiteful.